speaker is Martin Grossell, and he is a professor of ichthyology, I'm going to get these words all wrong, ichthyology with a specialty in environmental physiology and toxicology here at UM's Rasmus. Um, he's been a faculty member here since 2002, and he leads a group of about 12 to 15 PhD students and postdocs. Um, he is also the lead PI and director of the Gumry, another consortia that Gumry has funded called Recover. Um, he has published over 150 papers in the peer-reviewed literature, as well as numerous books and books chapters, book chapters on the physiology and mecha, mecha, mechanistic toxicology of aquatic organisms. Um, he will be sharing information on how we can determine the energy available for vital activities such as prey capture, predator uh, avoidance, migration and spawning, as well as overall sustained swimming performance um, that can be determined in pelagic fish. Um, his fun fact is that he has been fished obsessed since he was at the, at the tender age of four, and also he is an admitted chocolate addict. So without further ado, here's Martin. Thank you. Thank you. I will have a little time there that shows how much time you have left, five minutes or so. Just. Perfect. Well, thanks for that introduction, <clears throat> and thanks to you guys for being here. I realize that, that I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch right now, so I'm going to stick to my 20 minutes. <laughs> and online, so on the phone right here. So okay, so I'll stay here. Yes, yeah, so normally I wander a lot. I'm going to have to try and not do that. So I'm going to be talking about the work we've done on Mahi since uh, late 2010, uh, the year of the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. I haven't been here this morning, uh, but I'm guessing that you've seen something like this several times already. Uh, as you know, the spill is the largest in U.S. history, or was the largest in U.S. history. Uh, it occurred and lasted for almost three months and released about 3.2 million barrels of oil. Um, so it, it, it's pretty safe to say that this is an epic disaster, an environmental disaster of epic proportions. It, it was bad. You may also have heard about the settlement that was, that was reached a few months ago uh, between the U.S. government and BP, and it was basically based on these numbers here. And I, we're not going to go into detail on all these numbers. The, the, the one point I want to make here is that in total, it's estimated that two to five trillion fish uh, died as a result of this oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and this is based uh, mainly on sort of the early life status, the planktonic life phases of, or life phases of, these, uh, of these animals, as the previous speaker alluded to. And they are very, very sensitive to contamination with, with oil. And in particular, it's the PAHs that's causing the, the, the toxicity in these oils. So this is a high number. Now, this number translates to somewhere between but to about 4 million tunas died in terms of lost production or productivity, and about 2 million mahi as a result of the oil spill. So again, these, these, are, these are substantial numbers. But I would say that these numbers are based on what we know about acute toxicity leading to mortality in these early life stages. And undoubtedly, uh, effects occurred that may not have caused mortality immediately, but could have caused sort of delayed effects to many of these organisms and thereby the ecosystem. And that's, that's kind of what I want to be talking about today. But anyway, this, you know, this damage, I think, is a, is a good, probably conservative estimate, and it was the foundation for the settlement of BP. And we contributed to, uh, to the numbers in this column here. Like pretty much everything that's known about the impact on Mahi comes from the work that we've done here at Rasmus. Now, we work on Mahi, we have them in, in culture or captivity here at the university, and I'll show you a video in a second about how we do that. But this is sort of the life stage, and Mahi are actually uh, they're unique among pelagic fishes in that they have a very short life cycle. They grow to sexual maturity in about three months, uh, so they can start spawning with about, in about three months. And that's, this is an F1 or juvenile young adult uh, raised here in captivity. Uh, so at this point, they're actually sexually mature, they can start producing gametes and, and producing offspring. Uh, the broodstock, uh, we typically get them young. We get, we get the fish at about five, six pounds and then raise them for, typically we have them about six to eight months in captivity and by that time they're just too big to handle. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you a video in a second about how we go about getting new broodstock. <clears throat> now, mahi are amazing because they spawn daily in captivity if you treat them right. So every morning they'll spawn these embryos that we can collect and work on if we're interested in the early life stages. We can raise them to later life stages, even up to the F1s, and I'll be talking a lot about this life stage uh, in my presentation today. But obviously, all this starts with, with getting the broodstock. We do not use captive raised broodstock. All our broodstock is wild caught, and that's to make, make sure that we have, we don't have any genetic bottlenecks, and we don't have any selectivity going on in our captive animals. So offspring of wild animals 
exclusively is what we use for ex our experiments. Um, so yeah, this is a video just very briefly summarizing the process of getting this brood stuck. So we start early in the morning, we head offshore, we hook and iron angle these guys, and we're looking for smaller fish just because they're easier to handle and they cope better with the handling. We hook and line them, uh, we keep them on board this sports fishing vessel. It's a young, uh, mature female in this case. And we then bring them into captivity. This is still on the boat. We get them into captivity. We place them in quarantine tanks where we treat them for parasites and any diseases they may come in with. In fact, wild fish can be pretty dirty, so we've got to clean that up. And actually the same day, or typically the day after we catch them, they'll feed, and a few days after they start spawning, and this is the offspring you see here. And that allows us, as I mentioned earlier, to look at early life stages as the heart of a developing mahi embryo. The juveniles, the young adults in this case here. And for the young adults, what we can do is we can do swim performance experiments. Now, the previous speaker alluded to the fact that these oil or these compounds in oil that are toxic targets cardiac development. That's true. If we expose the early life stages to very, very low levels of oil during embryonic development, they develop heart defects. And in fact, it's really, really hard to raise them beyond a few days after exposure because without a functioning heart, you're not, as you can imagine, you're not really going anywhere. But what we've also discovered is that later life stages when they're exposed to these uh, toxicants, even at low levels, actually also show heart problems or cardiac function problems. And I'll be talking about that next. Um, what we can do is we can place these, these fish in uh, treadmills. So this is, uh, you're, la you're laughing, but this is, this is the equivalent of a treadmill. I don't know how many of you hit the gym this morning, but that's, that's the same as you on a treadmill, exactly the same. Okay, this is a 30-day-old animal here. They are exceptional swimmers, and in fact, as they grow, they become even more remarkable. So this is a, an 80-day uh, mahi that's raised in captivity here. I mean, you can see that just built for speed. In fact, it's one of the fastest fish out, uh, fish out there. We've done side-by-side -side swim trials with blackfin tuna, and blackfin tuna cannot keep up. So these are, these are super athletes. Uh, and just like a treadmill, what we can do with these swim tunnels here is we can crank up the speed. We control that. So this is now not you on the treadmill controlling the speed. This is the personal trainer cranking up the speed, right? So a couple of my students and postdocs have been working as personal trainers for years on Mahi Mahi. And uh, they are very motivated swimmers, but of course you can push them. You can push them to exhaustion. And that's what we do in these tunnels. What we also do in these tunnels is we measure, this is a fluorescent probe right here that will determine the oxygen tension in the water. And what we can do is we can periodically close this system so it's a, it's a fixed volume of water, and we're then measuring the depletion of oxygen in the water. That gives us a proxy for the metabolic rate of the animal. So we can exercise them, we can exercise them really hard, and we can look at how much energy they're consuming to swim at a given speed or cover a given distance. And with that information, you can actually learn a lot about how they're functioning, how their swim performance is, and how it may or may not be impacted. Uh, by environmental stresses, like uh, the contaminants that you find, find in, in crude oil. I'm getting exhausted just looking at this, so we're gonna, we're gonna move on. Now, the type of data we get from this, and I'm gonna take a few minutes to explain this. The type of data we get from this is a, is a relationship between the amount of energy the animal is consuming, so this, we use oxygen consumption as a proxy for that. The more oxygen you consume, the more energy you're burning. And we can look at that as a function of how fast they're swimming. And we're expressing swim speed here in body length per second, and that's too normalized for size, right? So a larger animal uh, obviously can swim faster because it is, it is bigger. Uh, so comparing small and large animals, it makes sense to express uh, the velocity in body length per second rather than, say, meters per second or kilometers per hour, whatever you want. And of course, no surprise here, the faster you swim, the more energy you consume. That, that should be no surprise to anyone. But what's really cool about these type of relationships is that you can determine their maximal swim speed. So you basically keep cranking up the speed until they can go no further. And we do do that. And uh, you can imagine what that would be like, right? You're on the treadmill, we keep cranking it up until you can't keep up anymore. You kind of fly off the treadmill. You won't see that in the gym very often. Typically, if that happens, that's an accident. Uh, but in these experiments, we actually we aim to do that. So we will exhaust the fish. Um, most fish will recover from that. Like you can actually recover the fish, retrieve the fish, and pick them up off the ground after they fall off the treadmill, and they'll be fine. For mahi, that's not always the case, and that has to do with the, the extremely high uh, performance that these animals display. But nevertheless, we can get their maximum swim speed, and with the maximum swim speed and this relationship here, we can extrapolate up to maximum oxygen consumption. So this is the 
absolute amount of oxygen they can take up in a given period of time. Uh, that VO2 max. Uh, you, you hear people talk about that for the Tour de France riders, for example. Right? It's, this is a measure of their extreme performance. And what we can also get, and this is another parameter that's really important, is we can extrapolate down to zero activity. So this is what you guys are showing right now. <laughs> or when you go to your physician and you've got to get your blood work done and your blood pressure, right? They, you know, they tell you to sit down and relax for 20 minutes and you're really worried about it, so you're actually not really relaxed anyway. But that's, you can tell people to do that. Sit down, relax, I'm going to get your resting metabolic rate. You cannot do that to a fish, and certainly not a mahi. Uh, so the basal metabolic rate or the lowest metabolic rate it requires that you stay alive for a fish like this is something you can never measure. It's something you have to extrapolate. So that's what we do here. From this relationship, we extrapolate back to zero activity, and that is the metabolic cost that you're staying alive. So in these experiments with these fish in the treadmills, we're getting these two parameters. And in fact, the difference between these two parameters is what we call aerobic scope. So that's the amount of energy that's available for any extraneous exercise. So if you're going to migrate, for example, if you're going to catch a prey, if you're going to avoid being eaten, if you're going to spawn, anything that takes exhaustion, this is what's available. So this is what matters in a biological sense for these animals. And it matters a lot for animals like mahi and tuna, for example, that are very, very active. They're very active lifestyle. If they cannot deliver oxygen to sustain this, this energy here or this demand, you know, they're not going to make it out there. So that's why this is really important to study. And I mentioned we get all this from the swim tunnel respiratory measurements. And what we can do is now we can look at what environmental stresses or contaminants do to this. And we know that there are two types of stress here. Uh, and they will both lead to reduced aerobic scope. One type of stress is limiting stress. So this is something that affects the maximal oxygen uptake. And typically what we look for here is things that will impact the gill. So the gill is basically the equivalent of our lungs. This is where gas exchange is occurring, where they take up oxygen, for example. So if that's impacted, there's going to be a limitation in the amount of oxygen they can take up from the environment. And that's going to cause a limiting stress. It's going to drop this number down. We can also have, have what's called a loading stress. And this is where the basal metabolic rate here is now increased. That can also happen during exposures to toxicants. Uh, so what's going to happen if you accumulate toxicants is your liver, for example, is going to start degrading these toxicants. That requires enzymatic activity, and that again requires energy. So you can see this number go up. And we actually do say, see that in the early life stages. So some of the embryonic life stages of these fish, they show an elevated basal metabolic rate. Um, so that can tell us a lot, of, again, about what's going on with these toxicants. Now, if you do get this limiting stress, you have reduced aerobic scope. And that means you have less energy available for capturing prey, avoiding predation, migrating for whatever reason you want to migrate, and of course spawning also. So this, this, this is critical. This is important for these animals. And what's really cool about it is that it's an in integrative measure of how the animal is doing. We may not know exactly why there's a reduction in VO2 max or an increase in the basal metabolic rate, but we do know that it matters to this animal. Now, when we do these experiments with uh, these young adult mahi here, so these are once about 90 days old. We look here at the aerobic scope. So the aerobic scope, remember, is the difference between the basal metabolic rate and the maximal metabolic rate. Okay. So the aerobic scope here, as you can see, at low, oh, at low exposure concentrations is not really impacted. There's really no difference here. And this, you know, and, and our previous speaker can attest to this, this is definitely an environmentally relevant concentration of pHs in the Gulf of Mexico. This higher concentration here, about 8 micrograms per liter of total pH, is, causes a significant reduction in aerobic scope. So these animals that have been exposed to this for just 24 hours are hurting. They do not swim as well. Well, they can't take up as much oxygen anyway, and it actually does translate to a reduction in what we call eucrit, which is that maximal sustained swim speed. So these mahi exposed for just 24 hours to concentrations that were definitely measured at the time of the oil spill showed reduced swim performance. There's no question about it. Now, we've looked at both the gill and the heart, and we can rule out the gill as the source of this reduction in oxygen uptake and therefore reduction in swim performance. So we've focused on the heart. So what we've done is not only can we put these animals on, on treadmills, we can also do open heart surgery on them. So we do that. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a happy uh, juvenile, a young adult mahi in captivity right across the street here. And what you can see is the ventricle here, this is part of the heart. So this is obviously responsible for delivering blood and thereby delivering oxygen to the muscle. 
we have the eventual aorta here. That's the blood vessel that leads from the heart up to the gill where oxygen is taken up and then back to the muscle. And then here we have a transonic flow probe that's basically inserted and covers this ventral aorta. And with that probe, we can basically measure in real time fluctuations in the velocity that the blood is moving through this blood vessel. And in fact, it gives us, because of course the velocity here is depending on contractions of the heart. So every time the heart contracts, this is, this is going faster. So it'll give us the heart rate. And we can also calibrate um, these measurements so we know exactly the volume of blood that's moving at any given time. And that'll give us the amount of blood that's expelled by the heart for every contraction. We refer to that as stroke volume. And if you have the heart rate and the stroke volume, you can calculate what we call cardiac output, which is the total amount of blood leaving the heart at any given time. Okay. And if we look at that data, <clears throat> this is again the young Mahi race across the street. We see that heart rate, which is kind of the easiest thing to measure, it's not really impacted by oil exposure. So that's not, that's not the answer. That's not why these animals cannot swim. But if we look at stroke volume, we see a very, very severe reduction. It's, it's almost a 50% reduction. So each time this heart is contracting in a mahi that's been exposed for 24 hours to oil, low levels, we see about half the blood leaving the heart compared to an un, unexposed and healthy animal. So this is a big deal. You can imagine if you had a 50% reduction in the amount of blood that your heart was pumping. You would feel pretty sluggish, I can guarantee you that. And uh, it translates to cardiac output, which is the total amount of blood leaving the heart over a given period of time. And this, again, is, is what's important for the animal. This is what functionally matters. So a 40-something percent reduction here. So, so these guys, um, they're hurting. So we know they can't swim. We know it's because they take up less oxygen. And we know that it's related to a reduction in cardiac output. Uh, so that's great. But we actually want to dig a little deeper. We want to figure out why exactly is it that the heart is impaired during oil exposure, following oil exposure. And what we're doing is we're looking at isolated myocytes. So what we can do is we can, uh, and, and this is no longer open heart surgery on a live animal, like we actually take the heart out, the mahi's now done, but we can isolate the cells from this tissue. We, uh, we basically put the tissue through a series of enzymatic digestions that'll isolate individual cells while keeping the cells alive. So this is one cell of a heart, this is, and this is, by the way, typical of myocytes, the muscle cells, they're very long like this, and, uh, and they'll contract, and that's how you get a muscle contraction. And what we can do with this cell is we can stimulate it uh, electrically, which is, again, is what happens, happens in, a, in a natural heart, and when we do that, you can see that the, that the cell is contracting. And this software here uh, will actually allow us to measure the extent to which the cell is contracting, and that's what, you're showing, what we're showing here. So we're basically getting now to function of an isolated cell, pulled out of a heart from an animal that was exposed or not to, uh, to oil. We can also uh, take these isolated cells and just expose them to uh, compounds from oil directly in the saline here to look at how it impacts the cell. And of course, the power of this over intact animal experiments or swim experiments is that you can get to a lot of cells in a single day, and you can get thousands of cells from one animal. Uh, so this is, this is a way of, of doing these experiments and obtaining more information without sacrificing a lot of animals. Okay. And that's something we're getting ready to attack uh, actually in just two weeks from now. And uh, Leila is in the back here. She's one of my grad students, and she's going to be actually spearing this expedition. But we're going out on a research vessel. I don't know if it's at the dock, but normally it's tied up right out here. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be assessing these big questions here. So if you have this reduction in cardiac performance and swim performance, what does that mean in the wild? You can probably guess. My guess is yeah, that's going to be a bit of an issue. They may have problems catching prey. They're certainly going to have problems avoiding predation. There's a lot of fish out there uh, that eat mahi, or just like we do, right? So, so they're going to have an issue. We've also seen, in addition to, uh, to cardiac impairment, we've seen that some of their sensory abilities are impacted by oil exposure. And again, of course, if you can't see or you can't smell, you have the same issues. You're not going to be able to find prey and avoid predation to the same extent. Well, at least that's the expectation. So uh, we sort of had two goals here. The ultimate goal is to uh, oil expose animals on board our research vessel, satellite tag them and release them, and then compare that to animals that have not been exposed before being tagged and released. Uh, but what we're doing two weeks from now is sort of a feasibility study where we're tagging about 20 fish just off the coast here and releasing them just to see where they're going. It's going to teach us a lot about what mahi do in the wild that, that we actually don't know, that we don't know at present. I'm going to show you a little video that sort of illustrates what we're doing. Now, the tags we're fitting these animals with, 
that will be called uh, temperature, light, pressure. That's going to tell us something about depth and the exact location. But in addition to that, we have accelerometers in the tanks. And these accelerometers will tell us, we hope, something about their day-to-day -day behavior. So the accelerometers in these tags, um, you'll see in a second, I'll show you in a couple of slides uh, how, how they work. But the idea is that by tagging animals in captivity, and we did this a few months ago, uh, you can see Leila working here with the team over at the experimental hatchery. What we did was we monitored these animals real time. We recorded their feeding behavior. We know obviously when they're feeding, and we recorded their spawning behavior while they were tagged. Now, we don't need the tags to tell us where they are. We know where these fish are, obviously. But the accelerometer in these tags, we recorded the data from the accelerometer and related that to the natural behavior. So the hope is that when we get acceleration data from the wild, we can interpret that data in the context of what we saw in captivity. And this here is actually spawning mahi. This is sort of X-rated, or it should be. <laughs> so the circle here, that is spawning activity. And in fact, in a second, you'll see uh, this individual here, I believe. No, it's not. I'm getting excited here, hang on a sec. It is one of the females here, is gonna, that's her, yeah, she's gonna fall back, and that is the release of eggs right there. That's the release of eggs. So that is mahi, more, uh, mahi spawning in captivity. Now we know what that looks like on the satellite tags with, the, with respect to acceleration. We know exactly what to look for. And the idea now is that we're gonna deploy these tags on wild fish, we're gonna get this acceleration data back, and based on that, we'll be able to tell when these animals are feeding in the wild, and of course where they're feeding, when they're spawning, where they're spawning, how frequently they're doing it. Um, and let me just illustrate uh, how that works in these tags. So this is a, this is a, a value. This is, you know, we use that for catching mahi all the time. Now obviously, if, if a mahi, in this case a bull mahi, is chasing a, a prey, it's gonna swim fast, and this tag, instead of sitting upright, it's gonna get knocked down, okay? So that's what it looks like during high acceleration. And what Lila has done is she's analyzed the data from these captive animals, and she showed that when a tag is knocked down below 70 degrees here, that is indicative of a feeding event. Okay, so that's what we're gonna be looking for in the data we're getting from the wild. Um, we refer to that as a knockdown versus an upright position. And whenever we see that, we, we know that that fish consumed the prey, right? Uh, the spawning is a little more complicated, and that has to do with, with the behavior during the spawning. You saw how these animals were sort of surfing each other. So what it looks like is, is that for the males, we're looking for an upright tag when they're spawning. And so they're not moving as much when they're spawning as the females. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Uh, whereas for the females, we're looking for a knockdown tag. So the, the tags knocked down in females typically uh, indicates a spawning event. Now, of course, this is gonna look like a feeding event also, so there's, there's gonna be some work uh, going into interpreting this data. But the hope is that from this data, these calibrations in captive animals, uh, we can interpret the data from the wild animals and, and be able to pinpoint where, when, and how often these guys are spawning and feeding. And that is a, a new application of technology uh, that we apply in biology to, to teach us in this case about the normal biology of mahi and then hopefully uh, in 2018 about the impact of oil exposure on these natural behaviors. Again, something that's never been done uh, in these or other animals. So we're super excited about that. And this here, just to show you uh, that my have been tagged in the past. It's been done a total of six times successfully, not with accelerometers, but simply with geolocation type uh, tags. And in this animal was tagged up uh, near Charlotte, and you can see that uh, over a six month period, it undertook a nearly 2,000 mile migration here. So when I'm saying that you know these are active pelagics and that swimming and cardiac function is important for these fish, you know it's no joke. Obviously, you, you, you're not going to swim 2,000 miles if your taker is not working optimally, right? Uh, so that, that's that's why this is super important. And of course, when you see data like this, you're going to wonder. So this mahi is hanging around in this area for a while. Why is it doing that? And what about this area over here? I mean, you can see it's moving it's moving south as as the weather gets cooler, you know, we can certainly relate to that. But something, something's going on here, something's going on here. What we're hoping is that these type of behaviors or these type of patterns, that we can make better sense of that if we know where and when they're feeding and where and when they're spawning. You know, one prediction could be that this is an area of spawning, perhaps. This may be an area of high prey density. That's why they're hanging out in that area for an extended period of time. Uh, we'll find out, so stay tuned. Okay. And uh, 
that, that's, I, I want to finish with that, the, the tale of Amahi here, and I want to just point out that if you're interested in, in what I've been talking about here or anything else related to fish, the oil spill, the Gulf of Mexico, check us out. We have a web page, um, a Facebook page. We're, we're tweeting and we're YouTubing. We're doing all that fancy stuff. I'm actually not doing that. We have someone else doing that for us. He's a lot younger than I am, so, so that's... Uh, but anyway, if you want to check us out, go there, and with that, I'll be happy to take any questions.